Matthew 9, verses 35 through 38. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. God bless this, the reading of his word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these words of yours. May these continue to speak to our hearts and our souls long after this service is over. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So as we look at this passage, we looked at four verses. And they're, they can easily be divided into two sections, 35 and 36, and 37 and 38. As we look at 35 and 36, we see that Jesus is going about and he's seeing people in need. So much so that he is moved to compassion. Uh, sometimes we're moved to just so much. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we see people who are in need and we're, we're moved to kind of kind of get involved, but not at the expense of our day, not at the expense of our loved one, not at the expense of our riches. We, we give out of our extra, and, and we want to help. And, and you know, there are a lot of people around who abuse the system, and there's this person, and there's that person, and the next thing you know, we become jaded. And there's a lot of people who really need help, but because a few bad people mess with it, People are not willing to be as helpful. In fact, Jesus is a bit overwhelmed. In chapter 8 and 9, he's going about and doing all of these healings. I mean, chapter 9, verse 35 sums up what's going on in these two chapters. And he's seeing people harassed like sheep without a shepherd. And they're left to their own devices. And so as Jesus is having compassion on them, it's, it's moved to beyond one's abilities. Now, Jesus, he's got any ability he needs. But as far as a normal human person, uh, this is a definite struggle because most of us are moved to our comfort level, maybe what might push us a little beyond. But most of us are only willing to give I can't say until it hurts, because most of us don't even get to that level. Uh, many of us, when we give, it's to make ourselves feel better. Or maybe just enough to where we think we made a difference. Maybe where we see the actual thankfulness in their eyes. I, I don't know. But Jesus is doing much more than that. And sure, he is healing people on a level that many of us will never be able to get to. Uh, but Jesus is being persecuted throughout the whole time. I mean, he's being ridiculed. He's being criticized. He's being insulted. And, and mind, we, mind you, it's probably very, very out in the open. Uh, and it's unfair. It's, it's definitely something that is unwarranted. The people who are supposed to be the servants of the people are their oppressors the religious leaders themselves. And in fact, many churches today have come to a point where the pastors can be viewed as religious oppressors, where they pile on and they heap on all these expectations, and yet they do not do what's needed to help those who are spiritually thirsty, spiritually hungry, spiritually in need. What? How, how can we tell, Pastor Matthew, which... Which church is doing that? Are you in that church? Are, are you doing this with Pastor Matthew, that's how I feel every time you talk to me. You're, you know, let, let's have this dialogue. Let's have this discussion. Uh, because one of the things that is happening is these religious leaders are seeing the things that Jesus is doing, and they are condemning him, not just whispering. It's getting to a point now where they're starting to bring it out in the open. And later on, Jesus stops doing miracles in towns because not only are these religious leaders going at it, but the people themselves then start to receive it and say, yeah, okay, he's about to do a miracle. And you want nothing to do with him because somebody's whispering something in your ear and shouting something on the corner that you really don't know. Maybe you've seen a little of that today. 
We have a lot of people with a lot of different opinions saying a lot of different things. And because none of us have the time to look it up, the, do the research, uh, we go with whoever seems to speak the loudest, the clearest, have the prettiest eyes, have the least amount of... You see where we're going? A lot, a lot of the times, the things in which we're believing, the things that we are holding to, are often so bullet-ridden that we... We don't know what to hold on to, so we just hold on to something. And these are the type of situations that can lead to a lot of problems, a lot of trouble. And we're seeing a lot of that now. Let's just pause for a second on whatever religion, whatever political party, whatever gender, whatever, whatever you are. I'm willing to bet that we can find people who are of your same whatever who are on the complete other side on the belief system. There are Christians who believe one thing and other Christians who believe another thing. There are Republicans and Republicans, Democrats and Democrats. There are men and men, women and women. Things are, just because you have some similarities doesn't mean that the people who are speaking speak for you. And that is one of the greatest problems we have today, especially in America, is because there are people who are speaking and we figure, okay, we can identify with six of the 25 things they say, but that's more than anybody else, so we're going to go with that. And that lumps us in with some of the things that we don't necessarily agree with. But because this one person's saying this one thing about this thing, then we're just going to go with it. And so gone are the days where people are able to think for themselves. Gone are the days where people are able to make decisions uh, no, forget about using the Bible. I mean, that's been thrown out a while ago, hasn't it? Yet, many of us are living life not based on decisions we get to make, but on decisions other people are imposing on us, and because we have no other idea what to do, we go with it. And this has been happening regardless of which president has been there, which house has been in control. This has been going on for a long time now, and frankly, I think most of us are sick of it, but we really don't know what else to do. Uh, hopefully, some of these problems that have been going on globally have been turning people towards God, not necessarily ourselves. And I think some of us have found more solidarity and solace in ourselves than in God. And I think, again, this is my thoughts, but I, I think people are not looking to see how they can help those in need but rather how they can find ways to say, this is where I stand, and I'm not budging. Jesus had plenty of stances, but when the people had a need, he never compromised his integrity, but he often put things on hold so he could deal with them. In fact, when Jesus is being criticized and ridiculed and all these wonderful things that are happening to him, he does not quit. Many of us, when we have complaints hurled our way, want nothing to do with it. Done. I'm out. Let's just, just stop right now. In fact, as we, as we see these shepherds abandoning their flock, these people are scattered like sheep without a shepherd. As we see these leaders step down, the people who need them the most have been left out, left alone. When people are left alone, other people and other ideas have a chance to make their way in. And all of a sudden, what was once good and holy and right is fraught with wrong, illness, separation. And we as Christians have to find a way to rise above this. As I spoke about before, this idea of wrestling with pigs and how in the end of it, everyone's covered in mud. We're both pig-headed and the only one enjoying this is the pig themselves. Arguing is not going to win us anything in anything. Some people enjoy the debate team just to debate. But I think, frankly, in the state of the way things are in the world, arguing versus lovingly doing are two different things. 
And how now can we do this? How can we lovingly do? And Jesus kind of looks at this next section here, and, and we're going from one end of the spectrum to the other, but these, leading, these leaders are not leading. And Jesus has something to say about that. And we definitely understand that when there is a vacuum, when there's a power vacuum, things go to try to fill it. When someone loses a parent, sometimes friends, television, new people, other people fill the void. When we move to a new place, when we change our lifestyle, when we go from addiction to a non-addiction, things fill the holes. There are vacuums. And so when the leaders of the people, the religious leaders, abandoned the flock, things started to creep in and take control. In fact, some of the leaders had abandoned God and something else crept in. And so then they, still as the religious leaders, going out and tried to lead the people. This leads to our next set of verses. Let's take a look at them for a second. Verses 37 and 38. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Agriculture and livestock. These are two of the big trades, uh, how people survived in the time of Jesus. And so as we look at these things, Jesus just gave us an example on livestock. The shepherds, the sheep. Now we see... That's right, a harvest, grain, maybe grapes, fruit. And we see the need for laborers. Now, we're not talking about foremen. We're not talking about people who can tell people what to do. We're actually talking about people who will go out and do it. We need the Nikes of the world. Trademark, I don't know. We, we see that as, as Jesus looks at the state of humanity, he sees that there's need, there's human need, and, and, and this need that people have is the opportunity for the gospel. Now, there are people who have needs, physical ailments, and he's going around healing them. But as he looks further out, he's reminding his disciples that it's not about the healings of the body, but it's more so about the healing of the spirit and the soul. And as he sees this opportunity, he realizes that it is a bountiful harvest. There is plenty of it. Having plenty of the harvest is a good thing. It is both good and plenty. As Jesus says this, we know that if we have an abundance of the harvest, but not a lot of workers, there will be enough for everyone to have more than enough. And there will even be some waste perhaps even a lot of waste. If there is not enough workers and the harvest is small, maybe everybody will get what they need. If there's an abundance of workers and the harvest is small, people are going to go without and there's going to be all sorts of need. If there's just enough harvest and just enough workers, maybe we can find this balance. But Jesus is not saying that's what the case is. Jesus says the harvest is Plentiful, abundant, great, grand, a lot. But the workers are few. The laborers are few. We have a lot of people in administrative positions who like to tell other people what to do, but not a lot of people who are willing to go out and do it. In fact, when Jesus says, pray to the Lord of the harvest, he's not just saying, recommend, give good words for but rather he's saying pray earnestly as one would compel the devil to come out of someone. One must compel workers and ministers to go out into the field. Forceful prayer, not ease. And this challenge that we have of forceful prayer is something that has actually been part of the theme verses of the church for the last three, three and a half years now. What? I didn't know that, some of you might be thinking. Well, a little while ago, I spoke to our board, and I asked them. I said, I want you to pray, set an alarm for 937 or 938, depending on which verse resonates more with you. AM or PM, I don't care. Set an alarm. And when the alarm goes off, 
read the verse and pray that God will bless our leaders, whoever is leading the church, whether they be on a children's group, whether they be in their board, whether they be one of our pastors, and to pray that the church would grow leaders among us and be able to send them to the community. Well, this is the end of, we're coming to the end of August, and there's already been a few people who have been released, but we have a few other people who are going to be released, and uh, they're not, not going to be coming to the church, but their ministries are going to be looking outside the walls of the church. But what that means is there's going to be a void. And anytime there's a void, like I just mentioned a moment ago, people or things will try to fill it. We need to pray that the Lord has been raising people up, and as the voids are created, the people in our church are willing to step in, volunteer, and take over some of these holes. Now, if you're not sure what I'm talking about, uh, please feel free to reach out to me, because there are definitely a lot of things going on right now. And we need people who love the Lord so much that they're willing to love other people in a position of leadership. And so as the weeks and months and years move forward, uh, I hope that our church does not stay the same. I hope there are new people who are leaders. I hope there are new people who are going out. And that's one of the places in which we're at right now, where we as a church have been praying to raise up leaders, but the time is we're sending people out and these holes are now going to need to be filled. And I'm reaching out to each of you who are watching today to ask you the question, what are you willing to do? Now, I'm not trying to bend anybody's arm, give a sob story or anything like that. What I'm asking you to do is I'm asking you at 9.37, at 9.38, whether it be in the morning, in the evening, or all four of those times, set an alarm and pray for the leaders of our church and pray that our church will develop leaders to send out to the harvest. This is a big ask because most churches want to grow in numbers. And while that would be awesome and I'd really like to see that happening, I would be more ecstatic if the kingdom of God grew, even if our doors had the same amount of bodies that came in and out of them. If people are going then we are doing our job. But if people are not being empowered to go and to grow and then go, then something's missing. And so we'd like to encourage you to start filling in these roles. Start preparing yourself for leadership so that you can do what you need to do to lead people to the Lord. So as, as we look at all of these things, we see that Jesus says that we need, he needed workers, not just wanted workers. There was a need. And if there wasn't going to be these workers, there was going to be a, a lot of waste. And opportunities are wasted. Just as many of us have wasted opportunities to do something good for someone, we have this shortage going on and, and someone fills the hole with something else. Hence why we have a lot of addictions and other problems. And we're not looking for people who can just tell people what to do. We're looking for laborers who are hard workers and people who are willing to do what's needed in love and with integrity. And we ask for a prayer of compulsion that people would feel uneasy. For those of you who are being empowered, for those of you who are going out, you have our blessing. For those of you who are coming in, you have our eager expectation. Needless to say, as you look at these verses, may the Lord speak to you. May you find compassion and give it to those who need it. And may you find leadership and lead where you're called. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for our time together. May your words sit on our heart and be present on our lips. May we exalt you in song. We thank you for this, the gifts you have given us with our scripture, or with our, through, the, through your scriptures, the gifts you have given us through our time and the funds that we can give to you. Lord God, we lift ourselves up to you. Say, here we are. Use us. In Jesus' name, amen.